So, uh, welcome everybody to uh, a Cirque seminar featuring uh, Dr. Max Lane. And I maybe should start out, many of you know uh, Max, uh, but he is more than just our typical academic uh, visitor. He is actually a celebrity uh, in Indonesia, maybe not as well known <laughs> here in Hong Kong. Um, um, I want to uh, therefore give you a, a thorough introduction to, to, to Max. Uh, even if he perhaps uh, uh, would prefer I not, but uh, can't resist. In the meantime, though, let me uh, give a little plug for the center. We have some information here about the center, some working papers. We have a regular working paper series. We also have another talk I want to remind you all of this week on Indonesia. Prominent Indonesians, Professor Michelle Ford, will be speaking uh, about trade union engagement in Indonesia's legislative and presidential elections held this year. Uh, that's at 415 B5311. So all of you here interested in Indonesia, please also try to attend Michelle Ford's for that. We offer you a long break until November uh, when we have uh, several seminars, one on Singapore uh, by leading oppositionist Dr. Chi Sun Wan. Um, that's on the 6th of November, the 10th uh, on urban governance in Yogyakarta, uh, and on the 17th, a seminar in Thailand, um, What Voters Actually Want, by Professor Alan Hinkan, who's known to many of you interested in Thai politics. We have further talks then later in the month. So I invite you all to those talks, and um, if more information about that is on our website. But let me say something more about Max has promised. Um, He's currently a senior visiting fellow at the Institute of Southeast Asian Studies in Singapore and a lecturer in politics and international studies at Victoria University in Melbourne. He's author of The Unfinished Nation, Verso 2008, Catastrophe in Indonesia, Siegel, University of Chicago 2010, and a number of other uh, published works. But the thing I wanted to stress, and the thing that, besides his uh, career also as an activist, his work as a translator. Uh, has made him well known to readers throughout the world, including, I might add, my own daughter, who recently read uh, one of his translations of Perugia's uh, famous uh, uh, Baro Quartet. And uh, Max's work on that, as well as on translating Rendra, another uh, famous Indonesian literary figure, have brought those novels to an international audience. And for that, we're all very grateful to Max for that work that he's done. But today, of course, he's going to talk to us about the 2014 Indonesian elections and the politics of post Suharto Indonesia. Max, it's a great pleasure to have you here. Thanks for coming. It's a bit of a, a sort of a contradictory situation to talk about Indonesian politics this particular year. Contradictory only in the sense that so much has happened, uh, which you have to sort of cover and analyze in a, in a short period of time, such as a seminar like this. As you, as you all would know, there were general elections for the Indonesian uh, lower house and upper house in April uh, this year, and in July there were presidential elections. Uh, and in between there's been a lot of maneuvering, and even in the last two or three weeks, uh, there's been developments with a, which a lot of uh, people in Indonesia regard as rather shocking in terms of uh, was not what was predicted what not most people, uh, most people predicted uh, would happen. So there's actually a lot to cover. I've decided actually to start uh, to sort of skip over, if you like, the parliamentary elections in, in April, but I will, and I'll be glad, but I will be glancingly referring to them. And to start with the results of the presidential elections, because in, in many respects, or in most respects, that it's, it's those results which, uh, especially that are set against the April elections, which have uh, given rise to the current uh, scenario that's unfolding, which I think has all the possibility to lead to either a constitutional crisis or, at the very least, a major crisis uh, of government. So, <laughs> presidential elections, you've you probably read in the newspapers what the basic results are. Joko Widodo, nominated by the Indonesian Democratic Party of Struggle, hit by Megawati Sukratakutri, which has, which has been out of government for two terms, won 53% of the vote. And, and uh, General, ex-General Prabowo, uh, 
Gosman, the remaining 47%. What's crucial here to note from the very start is that this is kind of a different result from the April election. Because in the April elections, the total vote for all of the parties which nominated and campaigned for Joko Widodo in the presidential elections amounted to 37%. And the vote for all of the parties that came nominated and campaigned for General Prabowo in the parliamentary elections scored 63%. And of course, this actually sets on the level of formal electoral politics and parliamentary politics a basic contradiction. That is, you've had two elections during the course of the year, and in terms, and in many respects, or in key respects, the results have been different. In the first election, the parties aligned with Prabowo got no more majority, but in the second election, they uh, lost to Joko Widodo by, by a narrow margin. I sort of regard this in many respects as, uh, even though, you know, formally, of course, Joko Widodo won, and barring <coughs> untoward developments, although there has been discussion in the media of the prospects of such untoward developments, he will be sworn in, in as president in October 20. But I think if you look at the macro political terrain, in some respects, this was a draw. Uh, and and uh, a lot of commentators and participants in the electoral process and in politics generally in Indonesia, right up to the last moment, did not really know who, was, who would win. And everyone was talking that usual phrase, we're going right down to the line. And this, uh, in terms of formal votes, I mean, Widodo got 8 million votes more than Prabowo uh, in an electorate of 190 million voters. Although we should note that 55 million people decided not to vote for either candidate. And a lot of others didn't bother uh, registering, registering at all. But what, what, uh, what we see in many respects, at least at the time of the presidential election, was the society, probably at all levels of society, divided in half. And one of the big polling companies, Indobarometer, for example, in a seminar uh, held recently, explained how, uh, in terms of voting intentions before the elections, in every single category, male, female, age group, uh, religious orientation, uh, regional location, the difference between those who supported Prabowo and those who, was, who supported Vododo was four, five, six percent. That is all of the categories, age groups, gender, location, they were all, you know, Either Wododo, 53, and, and, and uh, Prabowo, 47, or the reverse, or something like that. So you, have a situ you had a situation in May, June, July, where you had this uh, division. But it's also important to note that this, this development, is a re this, these, these results are, I think, reflect a kind of, there's a certain shallowness in the support for both camps. Uh, go back to the April elections and note that the votes for all the parties were very low. The Megawati's Indonesian Democratic Party of Struggle won, won the elections. I don't know where in the world you could find another example of where the party that came first got 19%. The party that came second got 14%, third 11%, and all the other parties below 10%. So there's actually no single party that has any, can show that it has really any significant uh, level of support and I think the ease with which uh, the vote shift from one side to the other, shifted from one side to the other during the election campaign also, also indicates this. And the fact also that 25% or 55 million people, uh, despite a very polarised environment, uh, didn't vote at all and that's been a trend in Indonesian elections over the last 10 years. An increase in an increase in a, in a stabilisation of a significant portion of people who didn't vote, whereas early after the fall of the dictatorship, uh, so had the dictatorship, the voter participation was pretty much 95 percent. Well, <coughs> the we don't know wins, but Prabowo actually claimed victory 
formally claimed victory and then took the results to the Constitutional Court. But the Constitutional Court uh, rejected rejected all his all his claims. But it's important to note these claims of victory and the and the general tone and attitude of the parties that supported General Kabul. Uh, from the very start, immediately after the elections, there's a photograph there of all of the leaders of the parties that supported Prabowo, very early on indicated that they would have a permanent coalition beyond the elections, that the coalition was not simply to support Prabowo's candidate, but they would that would continue a permanent coalition, which already indicated that they would dominate parliament with their 63% of seats. But also, uh, there was a statement by the deputy Prabowo's deputy in his party, Fadli Zon, that they, or wouldn't it be a pity, I hope it doesn't happen, that Widodo experiences what Estrada experienced, that is being removed from office in midterm by a hostile parliament. So this was already flagged early on, immediately after Widodo's victory. And since then we've seen uh, that 63%, especially in the last couple of weeks, move to uh, basically launched a very strong offensive against Widodo. Uh, in, when, in the old, if the new parliament has just been sworn in a few days ago, but even in the old parliament, where they also had a majority, they changed the rules of the parliament uh, to ensure that they would control the presidency of the parliament and all of the vice presidencies. And two days ago, when the new parliament was sworn in, that's what happened. So the Indonesian Democratic Party of the Struggle, the party with the single biggest faction in the parliament, got no positions in the, in the parliamentary leadership. And in Indonesia, that's, those positions are quite important. So the vice, the president of the parliament and all of the vice presidents are from the Prabowo coalition. Uh, no, no representation, and this is also like we happen today or tomorrow, I think it is, in the uh, People's Consultative Assembly, the, joint sitting of the upper house and lower house, it's, it's I think the Royal Coalition will take all of the seats, giving them basically ability to control all of the parliamentary procedures and processes, votes, setting up of commissions of investigation and so forth and so on. But in a sense, they're also still declaring themselves as winner. As I said, he took it to constitutional court key thing here though is that they did formally accept, a lot of people thought they might actually even reject the Constitutional Court, but uh, after the Constitutional Court rejected all of the appeals by Prabowo, there was a press conference of the Secretary Generals of all of the parties in the Prabowo Coalition who said, we accept this as the, as a, the legal result that we have to accept, but still complained that this was an unjust, unjust decision, which uh, Hopefully, people are saying might, might, mean, might constrain their behaviour because there are Joko, Joko Widodo in the press in the last few days has already announced that he's heard that they will prevent, try to prevent his inauguration as president. Well, I think the key thing, I mean, you already start to get a little bit of a hint of what the picture is, majority parliament and a president with a minority in the parliament and the majority in parliament going on the offensive taking all the positions. People expected, well, they give one at least to the largest party in the parliament, PDIP, but no positions, nothing, no mercy shown. No quarter given. I think it's, it's important to understand what's the terrain that you get first to divide, 50% vote, and the intensity of the conflict. Of course, we, you have to uh, understand the general socioeconomic terrain Indonesia is still a very, very poor country and the vast majority of the population still live in very miserable poverty. You probably all know the stats, $4,000 per year per capita, mean income of between $100 to $200 a month, with a lot of people not, uh, organized, uh, not even earning that, with a very huge uh, income gap between rich and poor, and even the Indobarometer, which is one of the better polling companies, registering that even during the election campaign, most of their respondents when asked what was the most issue most important to them, said it was the rich poor, the growing rich poor gap, which of course was not addressed by the candidate. 
In addition to that, for people living in the countryside, the question of land, their land ownership, uh, has also been a force of, of course, a, a source of, of, of social tension with various small explosions, even during the election campaign. For example, during the election campaign, there was a fight between 7,000 police and thousands and thousands of peasant farmers just outside Jakarta while the election campaign was un ongoing uh, over land issues, but with neither presidential candidate even mentioning it, even though I've got quite extensive coverage on the, on the television. The second sort of part of what's both part of the objective economic condition, but also in popular consciousness, is the issue of foreign economic domination. This is a map uh, showing the foreign ownership of various natural resources. This kind of map is on the social media, has been on the social media, all over the social media for the last 10 years. All over the social media for the last 10 years. So when politicians get up and campaign during the election about foreign domination of Indonesia's natural resources, that's something which has already entered popular consciousness. This, this kind of map, this kind of diagram, this, these kinds of facts, very, very dominant in both in the countryside and in the urban areas, where a lot of public utilities such as water, for example, are now also foreign owned. The water in Jakarta is owned by a French company, for example. And everybody is very aware of this. And of course, probably this, one of the biggest things in everybody's consciousness, which is part of objective reality too, is the widespread corruption. I think the statistics I put in my recent little book on decentralization in Indonesia indicated that something like 10,000 members of local parliament and uh, local government are now or have been or now involved in uh, court cases or police cases around corruption. So you have to sort of think of this. Thousands of people either in jail or about to go in jail but for the ordinary person, they can see that despite thousands of people going into jail, no lessening of corruption whatsoever. So it makes it a, you know, the arrest of so many people over 10 years, on the one level, just drives home the message, everybody's corrupt. But also drives home the message, no matter how many you arrest, doesn't make any difference. So it actually uh, turns it into a, uh, a very emotional issue for for um, for most people. So the campaign when when the politi the two presidential candidates started campaigning, putting forward their their issues, you have to understand the issues are being put forward to people, to a mass of 190 million voters, whose consciousness and daily experience are formed by these three major characteristics of the objectives and the features of the objective situation. Okay, with Dodo, how does he fit in? He's, everybody is trying to assess what he's doing next, so we need to know a, bit, a little bit about him. As people who you know, will be already in the newspapers here, I'm sure, and in all the international press, he was a leader in the Solo business community. Solo is a medium-sized town in Central Java. Uh, he approached first the Islamic parties to be a candidate in the election, but eventually ended up as the candidate for Megawati's party. He had two terms of mayor. He won the first... Uh, his first election with 30 something percent, almost 40 percent. During that campaign, he was the biggest uh, spender of the three businessmen. He's a furniture exporter, manufacturing exporter. And the two other main candidates he stood against in Solo at that time were also furniture manufacturers and exporters. But he outspent them much, uh, quite, quite out, you know, uh, outspent them, he outspent them significantly. He won that election. Uh, with 30 something percent or 40 percent but it has to be acknowledged the second time round he won with little spending 91 percent uh, and certainly the combination of the few policies he implemented and the way he and especially the way he presented himself was um, uh, very important uh, and i think the way i described it is it's kind of social safety net populism it's not the populism where you rail against the elite or foreigners, or some enemy. So it's populism without any enemy. But it's populism based on the prom promising the poorest layer a social safety net. 
So I think it's useful to consider the term perhaps, so I don't really like it, but anyway, it's, I think there's a certain element of truth in using the term precariat, talking about a layer of people whose life is extremely precarious, and if you give them a little bit, it allows them to take, to take even one step away from the, the drop, they're, they're, they experience a sense of relief, and in the patron-client political culture, also gratitude uh, in, 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 those, in those circumstances. With, after winning 91%, of course, he rises to national prominence. Nobody wins 91% in a free election anywhere in the world, I think. So he, it's a huge win, and he rises to national prominence. He's elected as Jakarta government, but again with only 30-something percent in the first round, when he's up against uh, two other candidates. And, close to 60% in the second round, but also with a big uh, absentee vote. His, his uh, style is what everybody, I think, is the first thing which appeals to people. If you ask them what's really his policies, not many people can give a clear answer, or they give an answer which actually refers to policies of the national government of President Yudhoyono, or Jokowi gives free schools. That's a national policy. You can go anywhere in Indonesia and there's free schools since under UDM. Same with health, cheap health. You can go to anywhere in Indonesia and you get some It's national government policy under instructions from World Bank, IMF, etc. to provide uh, minimal, free, minimal basic health and, and uh, education on the one hand, but to eliminate subsidies of basic of prices on, on the other to, to recoup the cost and actually make some money. The style is this going down, sort of folksy style of going down among the people. Being willing to sit on the ground, eat rice with them, chit chat, etc, etc. To say that I've seen your reality and I will listen. Now it's not all that a big thing, except that you just had 40 years of dictatorship, or 33 years of dictatorship, and 10 years of, of a, a, a 10 year period where all the politicians come out of the dictatorship, and have this style which I call pajabatism, pajabat being the Indonesian word for official. You relate to the people as an official. The people have to relate to you as an official. What you have to inculcate or what you have to uh, arouse amongst the people is a sense of awe and fear and your authority. That's not what he tries, he has tried to arouse. He has tried to arouse a sense of sympathy for him and the fact you can, I will, I will listen to you. I put you ajak bichara, which in Indonesian means to, you know, come and tell me, tell me your problems. And he's, he'll sit down and appear to be listening to um, what they're saying. So it's a, a very strong contrast with the status quo in terms of political style of the leadership, the politi political leadership, or the politi political officialdom that's come out of the 33 years of, of, of dictatorship and which persisted for at least the, the last 10 years, really even up till now as the dominant political style um, in Indonesia. He's a new person, Orang Baru. I'm not, he also says, I'm not captured by the past. I'm not blackmailed by the past. I'm not a part of the, I was not a part of the new order. I was not involved in politics. So this style sort of contrasts him, makes him appear as something new. His slogan, Jujua Sadahana Marakya, I'm honest, simple, close to the people. This contrasts him with the new order and presents, makes him feel, make, it presents himself as something new. But I think this is not, it is new compared to the new order, compared to 15 years ago. But in fact, his actual policies are really a product of the current status quo. His policies are a reflection of what has actually developed under you, do you know, especially in the, most especially in the economic sphere over the last 10 years, but also in politics. Because what's evolved after 10 years is something which in Indonesian history is totally new. Elections, or you know, genuine elections, or elections where parties and figures actually have to win some form of popularity in order to become governor or district head or mayor or president. In the Indonesian context, it's really something completely new. 
no one during the Sahada period had actually been popularity in the normal sense of you know mainstream or bourgeois electropolitics. And the second thing is, of the last ten years, you've had this process of decentralised capitalism. You've had these decentralisation policies implemented, which give a lot of uh, policy authority to local government plus significant budget to local government. While Jokowi, while Joko Widodo was mayor of Solo, the income transfers he received from Jakarta increased the budget, the income of the Solo City, which is 500,000 voters, by 400%. So he had plenty of money to play around. Nothing to do with money he collected, that's money transferred from the central government to him, increased 400% during his two meals. Mainly uh, <coughs> selling coal to, I don't know, your country? Is China your country? I don't know. They sell, coal, sell, sell, country to, sell coal to the People's Republic of China. That's what is the source of the ability to increase uh, local government incomes by 400%. In provinces with natural resources, like in East Kalimantan, the local government's revenue, revenue increased 1,400% over eight years. So this is a decentralization, boosting small and medium business to a, to, a, to, a, to a bit of an extent at the local level. And if you follow Joko Widodo's policies, his espoused policies, they're basically policies of continuing that and continuing to try and promote and assist small and medium capital based in the local areas, which in the Indonesian case is 95% of all capital, or even 98% of all capital. There's a bit, as I said, this, I'm just evo is trying to elaborate here a certain contradiction where he's, he, he's, he presents as something new, and his political style is new, but what he actually represents is not something new. It's new compared to 15 years ago, but it's not new compared to what's evolved during the last uh, 10 years, which is a, 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 this electoral, decentralized, neoliberal uh, capitalism. And it's interesting, in his speeches on TV, the question of poverty as a major issue is never mentioned. The issue of foreign domination of the economy, never mentioned as urgent, defining issues. So again, his, his style is new, but in many respects, he, doesn't, he, has, he didn't really emphasize in his electoral campaign um, in any sort of break from the economic policies of the Udo period. And I think the fact, the fact that this became more and more evident, style new, but substance not all that a big break from the Udo period, was also what allowed during the election campaign for Prabowo to make gains. You know, Jokowi, the polls started off started off with 65 percent, approximately. Some said 63, some even said 70 percent. But during the election campaign, his vote actually goes down. He still wins in the end, 53 percent, but his polling went down during the election campaign, and Prabowo's went up, of course, with the fear of everyone actually thinking that this the Prabowo might even win. I mean, I went to seminars in both you know, Indonesia and Singapore in the last couple of weeks, and a lot of the pollsters, academics, and participants were all saying, oh, we're, and the Wododo people saying, we're going to lose. And I still had Wododo campaign people high up in the country campaign structure telling me, Max, if we went for another week or two weeks, we would have lost. And I think a part of this, yes, there's a a lot of horrible black propaganda against Jokowi. He's Chinese, he's Christian, and so forth and so on. But I think that more strengthened the core support for Prabowo rather than expanded support for Prabowo. I think it's true when Dodo's own campaign was, was, was difficult. I used to say shambles, but the more I get information, it's, I think it's not totally his, his own fault that uh, he was often late for meetings like seven hours late, six hours late for rallies with thousands of people waiting. But the more you hear of how it all unfolded, it was extremely difficult for him on the ground to, to, to do things. But anyway, whatever the reasons for, it was a bad campaign. 
in addition to the fact that in terms of policy, what was he offering those who, whose consciousness is formed by poverty, foreign domination, nothing real. And I think, I think the analysis that he lost because of bad campaign or, or uh, you know, the, the, black, the black campaign against him is a bit of a shallow analysis which doesn't give enough weight to, what, to the consciousness formed by the socio-economic socio context. Prabol, on the other hand, in all his speeches, although I think it's the complete, total demagoguery, empty demagoguery, emphasised poverty. What you know, one thing that struck me most was in a, a national TV debate between the two of them on defence policy. So here you have General Prabowo, a former general, in a debate on defence policy up against Widodo, the former furniture exp uh, exporter and successful mayor. Widodo is arguing what kind of tanks. Indonesia should have. Prabowo's response is, look, tanks, aeroplanes, jet fighters are all meaningless if the people stay poor. The real defense of Indonesia is to increase the prosperity of the people. Having all this weaponry, although he actually argued for the heaviest tanks, but his demagoguery was, with all this weaponry, it's all pointless, if the Indonesian, the mass of the Indonesian people stay poor. And he hammered and hammered and hammered and hammered relentlessly on that. He never came up with any concrete policies as to what he would actually do, except, I wouldn't call it a policy, but an argument which has actually, I think, a significant element of truth to it, but becomes empty if there's no policy prescription with it. Namely that one of the reasons the country is poor is that the, the character of the international economic relations with foreign capital, the domination of the natural resources by foreigners and even public utilities, impoverishes the country. And he's, he hammered again, I will change the nature of the, of the relationship with foreign business so that Indonesia gets a better deal and the, and the, better, the money we get from the better deal will go to reducing poverty. Again, how he would get it, which companies he would negotiate contracts with, what changes in the actual relationship he would concretely, could uh, concretely identify. He always avoided these questions and never answered. But hammer, 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 hammer. I think this was also a part of the reason his, his uh, support increased during the election. Is he presenting something new? Because th this was a bizarre element of the campaign. On the one hand, there was a theme to his campaign which gave an echo, a sense of return to Sahato. Sahato's daughter, his ex-wife, traveled with him everywhere and appeared on stage. His main other ally, the head of Golkar, Abu Rizal Bakri, in April campaigned on the theme it was better under Jakarta, under Sahato's era, wasn't it? So there's a lot. We will make Sahato a national hero through our majority in the parliament. It was another part of uh, Prabowo's campaign. But on the other hand, his, his nationalistic, populistic style, even down to the point of what kind of microphones he made sure he had in front of him all the time, there were 1950s microphones that people were familiar with in the photos of, Su of Sukarno. So he's mixing, mixing the style of Sukarno plus references to Sahato. Of course, you're also getting a huge number of voters, young voters who didn't really have any direct familiarity with Sahato or Sukarno, whom you can imagine disappearing to be uh, something new. But the, and I think the worrying, one worrying element of this is you also saw the emergence of organizations like GRIB, a militia organization and other sort of very right wingish militaristic um, volunteer militia organizations under his party's control. One contrast with Sahata, though, is Sahata's policy was no politics, floating mass, shut up, no ideology. Whereas a part of the whole change to electoral politics means you have to win popularity on the basis of something. So you have Prabo, Sohato, but with agitation. Not floating mess, not keep quiet, but agitate people around issues. So I think this is also a new feature in uh, right-wing politics in Indonesia. So 
the division between the people who identify with decentralized capitalism plus cronies is one division in the elite. Dick Prabowo and his forces, Bakri, a multi-billionaire who runs Golka, but he bought Golka, uh, represent, wants to return to a, a, a political economy where crony capital is really dominant, whereas we know those more aligned class-wise with all these thousands and thousands of small and medium business, or even larger business, small and medium at the, at the local level than larger business at, at the province level. Yusuf Kala, his vice president, running mate is also a millionaire, but a millionaire who's based in a province, Sulawesi. But what about the divide amongst the massive voters? I think the elite divide's fairly clear. Crony, ex-crony wanting to be crony again, versus Widodo, a small, medium capital. But what about amongst the masses? Now, I'll tell you one story. I, I went on the election night after the, it was announced Widodo had probably won, down to Jalan Tamrin, where a few hundred people, a thousand people had collected, all Widodo supporters, sort of trying to celebrate, and all celebrating, depending on yes, their personality. But one of them came up to me and said, I asked them, you know what? You know, half vote for Prabowo and half vote for for uh, Prabowo. What what's the difference? The people, your 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 masses who vote for Widodo, what do they want? They want a new Indonesia, he said. My friend, long term activist. Said, but the people voting for Prabowo, if you speak to them, the ordinary people, they say Prabowo, they also want a new Indonesia. Yes, Max, he said, it's just a matter of taste. Just a matter of taste. In Yahanya Masarah Salera. Just a matter of taste. Is it really that arbitrary? Well, as I said, I think the, the division in the economic elites clear. It's a matter of poor against cronyism. The liberal, urban, white collar, cosmopolitanizing layer is is also a divided, but a bit more difficult to assess the precise criteria. But I think in the mass the mass culture, we have to recognise that. The underdevelopment of capitalism in Indonesia, the, the fact that the mass of workplaces are, in Indonesia are tiny, small. In Widodo's own city, where he's mayor, 30, uh, one third of the population classified themselves as self employed, and one third classified themselves as working for an enterprise with two or three employees. And in that kind of small scale, that world of small scale workplace, you, your the old pre-capitalist psychology of, pat of the patron-client culture, your life can be shit or better, can be good, it'll be shit or better depending on whether your immediate boss is a creep or not. You're looking for a good patron. And I think that mentality transfers to the national political sphere as well. And that's where the taste comes in. You know? Who, which of these two characters will be the best patron? Or you might ask, but surely in assessing the best patron, their people's political record will be counted. Isn't Prabowo someone who's kidnapped, disappeared people, in fact, murdered and tortured people? You can talk to people, you have a debate with ordinary people. People either decide to believe or not to believe. Yes, he did, no, he didn't. The reason why that act mentality is possible, because over the last 40 years, there's been no establishment of any kind of concrete history. You, you learn lies at school about history of by heart. History becomes legend. And you choose to believe the legend or not. Or which legend are you going to believe? There's no compass. There's no inherited picture of reality which helps you define whether somebody's political record, as you hear it, is, is true or not. Or is it just what the enemy says? Oh, everyone against Prabowo says that, but did he really do it? Or oh, the general said he did it. Or oh, another ten generals who said he didn't. Who do you believe? In a, in a, uh, when in a period over 40 years, there's been no discourse which help, helps establish some, some way uh, to understand and analyze history. I think I think this also reinforces the, the taste argument. It 
it's a, it's a part of client consciousness in a, pa a patron-client political culture. Talk about the culture here, I mean, obviously, in, the, in the, these small enterprises, not a patron-client economic relationship, but the culture is this patron-client where you're dependent on your immediate uh, superior and you're looking for a patron whose personalities make them the, the better patron. Is there any challenge to this patron-client culture? The key, the most crucial development in the last few years has been labor, trade unions. It's a sociological and political phenomenon which is undermining client consciousness. You have these big industrial belts with hundreds of thousands of workers in them, working not in small enterprises, but in large enterprises, 1,000 workers, 5,000 workers, in a modern factory setup, where there's no patrons, you never see the boss, probably in another country somewhere. You never even see the manager, really. All you see is your foreman. And that, that over the last 10 years, has also planted the seeds of a collective consciousness, which is not only in the sociological sphere, what factory life is like, but during the last few years, there have been also some very large collective industrial struggles, which has reinforced this anti-client consciousness. There's been mobilizations. There's constantly strikes in this or that factory. Some of the mobilizations have involved hundreds of thousands of workers in nationally coordinated demonstrations and protests. And there's also, in this whole labor phenomenon, the interesting syndrome of what I call self-leadership. That is, in the absence of strong leadership from the formal union leaders, you have what's called sweeping, where, where factories of militant workers will travel around the industrial estate and try and urge other workers, come out too, come out too. They'll shake the gates. You know, 500 workers, 1,000 workers from one factory will go to a neighboring factory, shake the gates, come out, come out. Because the people in the factory have had no instructions from the formal union leaders, or very wishy-washy uh, instructions. All these are sort of signs of, of uh, on, you know, on the what of, of an erosion of client consciousness amongst the factory workforce. But there are limitations. Firstly, the factory workforce is a small percentage of the overall workforce. Maybe two million, three million, hard to get the exact figures. Some say five or six million. Some say there are 30 million in the formal workforce, but a lot of the formal workforce is also in very small workplaces. In a, you know, the voting population, it's adults who have the right to vote, 190 million people. It's actually a very tiny percentage. Although they're in a good bargaining position, because that tiny percentage produces most of the value added of, of, of the Indonesian, in, in, the Indonesian in, the, in the real production processes of the Indonesian economy. And, and half a million or a million people would be a very good critical mass to start some kind of political movement, although you would have to have across 500,000 people or a million people a high level of political consciousness and combativeness. But given what we've seen already, I mean, you have to sort of think here, you've had in the last few years national protest mobilizations from Labour of 500,000 to a million people, when these unions did not exist five years ago. So you can't rule out a rapid radicalization when, when unions which didn't exist, because under Sahata there were no unions, and it took almost a decade for a new sort of consolidated union structures to develop. Um, it just, it's, it's, very, it's not impossible, I think, for that radicalization to take place. Um, but there's other contradictions as well. There's limitations, there's also contradictions. The union bureaucracy that's evolved over the last several years, you know, has its own contradiction. It's not like in the Sahato era where the state appointed the leaders. You have to get elected as leaders or keep your position in some way or other. You have to deliver something to the members. And the way that this was done by some of the unions, or all of the unions really in the first phase, was through these big mobilizations, especially 2010-2011. Protest mobilizations, including ones which campaigned for a social insurance bill in Parliament, which succeeded. So this health insurance, social insurance bill, was actually pioneered by the unions with big demands, tens of thousands of people supporting the introduction of this bill. 
But by 2013, as this, these big mobilizations took place, the employer resistance hardened. More and more th uh, organized large groups of thugs deployed against the workers. And I read just two days ago a statement by the head of the Employers Foundation that a new militia trained by the army has been launched um, to protect factories during strike, strike periods. There's been a real hardening in, in the last protests last last year in October and November, quite a few workers ended up uh, in hospital, beaten up by uh, Prima or thugs. And it's in this context that a lot of the key, the union leaderships have actually turned to reactionary politics. Unions in Indonesia have always been political. During the Zahato period, of course, they were simply an extension of the political power of the state. And um, during the most recent period, uh, they've been campaigning for the social insurance bill, the health insurance bill, been in direct negotiations with the government, openly campaigning for different policies, different political policies. But in the face of the hardening of the uh, employer resistance, they've shown an unwillingness to es escalate their own militancy, even to call for strikes. In the last two years, they've had what they call Mogok National, national strikes, but there have been no strikes. There were national protests when workers came out of the factory at the end of shift. Except when the work workers from militant factors did sweeping to convince some of the workers to come out. So in this context of un the union leadership being unwilling to radicalize, what they've done is seek alliances with the elite. Some have seek alliances with the PDIP of Joko Widodo. And more worryingly, the most active of the union, the metal workers and those around it, campaigned strongly during the uh, election campaign for Prabowo, still support Prabowo, and have just issued an internal decree, and I'll finish on this note, um, banning their members to have any cooperation or contact with a whole range of left-wing people, NGOs, or anyone who didn't support the ball. So a decree has gone out from the leadership of the union, no workers allowed to talk to this list of people. But of course, I'll show one more slide, I think. Amongst the membership, uh, there has been resentment at this decision. Some factories have left, other factories have for formed dissenting caucuses, 50, 60 factories. There's been factories who made carried out strikes in alliance with un unions in a different confederation or not in any any confederation. And there's a network of people who've gone through left-wing political causes over the last 10 years who are also in opposition against the union leaderships. And there are also half a dozen smaller left-wing unions which are still still alive and playing a role in this context. I'll stop there. Thanks very much. Thanks for that interesting presentation, but also for the uh, advertisement, as it were, of our next talk, given the importance of unions at the end of what we were saying. Um, we have time for questions, if there are issues you'd like to raise. Max, maybe I'll start out then. Can you talk a little bit about the kind of scenario you see possibly playing out, given the hard line proposed supporters are taking in the parliament. I mean, is it is it deadlock or is it even a, a failed presidency from the beginning as a possibility? What kind of scenarios do you see as likely? I don't really know. I mean, the, the scenarios range from uh, the, the the mechanism when on October 20, just the date that Bordodo is supposed to become president, is that the election commission will present a report to the NPR People's Consultative Assembly saying that no, the elections take place and we don't know who's the winner. And the various leaders of the NPR, the president and vice presidents, should sign off. So if they're consistent with you know, what the announcement they made after the Constitutional Court, that yes, we accept this is the legally, legal, uh, the legality of it all, they should sign off and the court and we don't know will be president. He himself has said, I've heard that there's conspiracy to prevent me becoming president two or three days ago. So, I don't know whether that will happen or not. And if that happens in Indonesia, 
will not have a president. Although theoretically, with a majority in the NPR, they could pass a decree changing the, or pass a law, basically changing the electoral law, saying that the president should be elected by the NPR, in which case Prabowo will become president. That might be going too far, I don't know, because I don't know what the foreign various foreign governments around the world are saying to the players. And it would, it would, it would, it would, it would create a lot of unease in Indonesian society. Um, the, the, you know, the next grade down is that is that yes, he's sworn in, or well, he's not sworn in because he's, there's no process of swearing in the president anymore. He's not elected by the NPR. So it's the NPR signing off in the election commission's report. So he becomes president, but then the majority in the parliament tries to rule from the parliament, tries to govern the parliament. They've already said they're going to amend 122 laws. Banking, telecommunications, a long list of all the laws that they say they're going to amend. Of course, they don't have the ministries to execute the laws, but they can certainly change the laws. They could call back the budget and amend the budget. Uh, the Indonesian parliament has very strong powers, even down to changing individual items in, in, in budgets, in the, each ministry's budget. So I could do all sorts of things like that, and up to now, it looks like a very, uh, you know, it looks like Prabowo forces are really on the offensive. Now, my last slide, which I should have squeezed in, uh, raises the question, well, what's, what's, all the polls show that there's very strong support, support for direct elections, which the, which the Prabowo majority has done away with. But it's, it seems to me to be more a sentiment. That's why I was looking for a word, what's the word, unease. But you don't see any occupied, actually on the Facebook, the social media now, People are saying, let's, let's replicate Hong Kong and have Occupy in, in Indonesia. But this, you don't see a, any sign of it. Because the question is, who can lead it? Who has the authority to lead it? You know, and the logical person to lead it is Wudodo and his party. But in a statement two days ago, one of the leaders of his party said, we, yes, we could get a million people on the streets, but we're not going to. We're going to pursue this through legal channels. So the question is how, you know, you have this electoral uh, anomaly. April, the Prabowo parties win. Uh, July, the pro-Jokowi, pro-Widodo parties win. Who actually is, has majority support in the Indonesian population at this moment? The polls say, you know, uh, Widodo and direct elections, but polls, no. They're not going to. They're not going to change anything. And so that's why some of the people in civil society are saying, "Come on, occupy, demonstrate, mobilize, show you have, show concretely that you have majority support." Um, my fear is that if they don't do that, then uh, Prabowo will be increasingly involved. And even if he's sworn in now, as time goes on, uh, we don't know will be even more undermined if there's no actual fight back against the wars against the I just wanted to follow up on, uh, on Mark's comment. Uh, you know, over the last 10 to 15 years, probably, there's been a large literature now on the so called Democrat recession, the Democrat rollback. And the bottom line seems to be the real culprit uh, tends to be the executive, the president or the prime minister. And their fault really is just to commit a lot of executive abuses, usually corruption or tinkering away with uh, civil liberties or something along these lines. And if, if the good guy is supposed to be the legislature, that then hold the executive accountable and contain these kinds of abuses. But that doesn't seem to be the pattern in Indonesia at all. Instead, what we're seeing is an executive who is pretty much blameless, not even having the power yet. And it isn't said the legislature seems to be committing lots of abuses uh, before it comes to power. So I guess what I'm wondering is whether there's a distinctive route that's even clearer in Indonesia now about democratic breakdown or at least rollback. And the other question would be whether, in your mind, if we were to lose democracy in Indonesia, would that really matter? 
because you know I think about the kinds of concerns you have and the kinds of social change you might like to see, and I'm not sure that that would be particularly compatible with I guess this shallow form of procedural democracy at all. So, so I guess I'm, what I'm asking is, can democracy break down in Indonesia in a wholly new and unique way that we've not yet seen? And again, if that happens, um, should we really care? Well, I don't know how unique it would be. I mean, if uh, Prabowo gets his way, gets his way, he will be the executive. And, and your pattern of the executive doing all the abuses will be what happens. So you know, if if, if that's the scenario, we're just in a in a transition towards towards that scenario. But I think that I don't, I don't know how unique it is. It probably is a certain uniqueness to it, and, and that's that is a result of the 33 uh, years of new order and the complete destruction during that 33 years of any. Uh, popular organization and even the tradition and memory of popular organization has disappeared. So there's no counter this in terms of the, you know understanding the what's happening from a class analysis point of view, there's only one class with any effective role in politics. That's the capitalist class and it's doings. The ex cronies who want to be cronies again and uh, Small and medium capitalists who probably want to be a bit bigger capitalists, but don't actually don't actually see the crony system as what they want. There's a lot of them. They like you know liberal capitalism, free like you know freedom of the market capitalism, including freedom to bribe. So corruption is is widespread, but there's not a list of your top ten cronies who have privileges because there's a authoritarian central government that determines who they you know these. These are my mates, they get all the first options. That's not operate that has not operated since the Hunter Bill. And a lot of these cronies, or ex cronies like Bakri, Prabhu himself and his brother and others like them, they actually need that's why they're not giving in, they actually need to be cronies. They built their empires on crony relationships. They can't actually survive without that uh, state back. So the absence of popular forces means that there's no counterbalance. It's just a game between the two factions of the of the capitalist class, and there's no counterbalance. So that's why I think the labour thing is extremely crucial. Although you know the, the the problem is there's still a lot to happen in the labour sphere. The trade unions' involvement in the elections, because of the character of the trade union leaderships has been completely subordinated to the conflict between the two elites or the two factions of the elites. There's no pre there's no there was no working class presence in the election process at all. The unions, you know, the metal workers union organized a big pro proboa demonstration, but doesn't represent anything. It was done the decision to support proboa was done without any consultation whatsoever with the membership. Zero consultation zero processes. So there's no way, it's just the different union leadership shoring up their own position in a situation where the only way they can deliver increased benefits to their members is to fight a very vicious you know, capitalist fight. So it's already resorting to militia to defend their factories. So I think there is a certain uniqueness insofar as the the extent of elimination of popular organizations, so the grass you know, unions basically, either work or peasant unions or similar types of organizations, the extent of elimination of them and even the memory and tradition of them uh, has given gives the capitalist class uh, scope to to muck around with you know democracy uh, much more than in, in a, a lot of other contexts, although maybe you know Russia and Southeastern Europe have some similarities, but I'm not really, I don't really know enough about what's happening there to say. Are there other questions? Oh, yeah, I, uh, I, I found the election really inspiring, because uh, you don't expect that uh, in a country like Indonesia, with a very uh, new democracy, that you would have what turned out to be not just something political, but even something psychological. And I, I found your comments really interesting that uh, there was no discernible difference in the, the demographic depending on where you were, 
class lines, a country city, anything like that. That made it almost seem to me like um, it's almost like a conflict within the individual, you know, that's kind of like a, I don't know, almost like an analogy of a child thinking about whether they're going to leave home or not. Part of you wants to stay with what's familiar, i.e. Suharto, and a part of you wants to, to risk it on the, on the chance of, of Jokowi. So I was wondering if you could say anything more about if there is any kind of a, a different demographic, you, you might want to think that, you know, with someone very Mussolini-like, like Probovo, that there would be a kind of a machismo that would get out more of a male vote or an older male vote. And the second question, um, the way the, the election ended seemed very bizarre. There was a, about a seven point spread, seven percent spread, and if, it, if that's happening in a, in a normal democracy, that's pretty significant. You know, in Canada we had a referendum that was less than one percent about Quebec splitting, and there's absolutely no no fuss about that, but uh, for Propo to go to such an extent that uh, he was he would invoke the, the court and then humiliate himself in front of the court and then try to surround the court, you almost had a sense, I certainly had a sense that he felt he could almost pull off like a good old traditional coup or something. Did that represent a political naivete on his part or was it kind of a foreshadowing of what you said might be coming with this? Keel hauling of Jokowi. I think the the features of the objective situation that I you know, put up, summarising the poverty, the foreign economic, the, the corruption, the jabatism, of this sort of official officialism. Um, you know, if you talk to ordinary, if you talk to you know so you know men on the street or people that or war organised people like unions and so on, but you know bottom layers of society, either in the capital or in provincial towns or even in villages. In you know, my voice, I, my impression in the last several years has been that the kind of lead, kind of patron leader, the kind of leader, the personality they were like, would be somebody who's Dujur Sadahana Marakyan, which is with all those things, you know, honest, simple, close to the common people, but also to gas firm and decisive. And in the general discourse or whatever the word is, you know, in the vocabulary used to describe the two leaders, you know, Widodo's got simple, you know, simple and honest and close to the people and Prabowo's got decisive. What actually everybody wants is somebody who's simple, simple, honest and close to the people, but also decisive. And I think that's, that's why there's an element to the psychological division because people want they want a personality. They don't think in terms of policies or, in the current moment anyway, they think of personality, figure, leader, president. They want someone with all those. But in the end, you, it's not neither of the candidates are seen to have the way they've been become presented. Seem to have both. So you just have to well, it's almost which way do I lean? Um, and I don't know that this, you know. I, I don't know how things will evolve now because if if Widodo doesn't lead against Prabowo, then his reputation, you know, the hope that he might be decisive will be undermined quickly. I think the other the other worrying element is that the whole process from April to July has seen a very strong. Uh, uh, atmosphere of there, uh, there being two, 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 only two choices. A lot of the NGOs, part of the left, and also you know, Jokowi is the way. As a consequence, this that strengthened the idea. There's just two choices. And the worrying thing is if uh, Jokowi seemed to have failed, if Wododo seemed to fail, either as president or as uh, you know, poli political leader who's expected to be effective in playing the game against Prabowo, then in a situation where people only see two choices, a significant additional percentage who will switch back to Prabowo. Because who else is there? What else is there? And that's quite a worrying feature if, if uh, you know, Wododo in the Indonesian Democratic Party don't, don't fight.
but all their statements are, you know, we've got it in the bag, or we're working out something, or we'll go through legal processes. And I think that's uh, uh, you know, that's a sort of worrying feature. So I think it, there's a lot of um, and so I think to answer your question, I think it is more a more a harbinger of what might possibly be coming, rather than simply a reflection of the, the personality flaws of Prabhu and so on, which he has. I mean, he was very uh, what's the word? <coughs> angry and and and, uh, and bad loser kind of mentality, but. Uh, and a lot of people at the top say, oh, this is just bad loser mentality, he just wants revenge. His coalition will fall apart. Everyone was saying that. His coalition will fall apart because Indonesian parties, they all just want to be part of the government and all go over to Widodo's side. And I think that's what PDIP in uh, Widodo, Widodo were all expecting. But up until now, the Prabowo coalition has remained solid. So, you know, everyone will say, ah, this party or that party will cross over. And, I mean, there is, there is an argument, you still hear in Jakarta circles that this party is also pragmatic and opportunity to do Who knows in the end? But still saying, oh, this, this offensive in parliament is being, sm being supported by the smaller parties supporting Prabowo because they want to show with Dodo, listen, if you don't give us some ministries, Look what we'll do. So there's still, and Widodo itself, well, people can, even Widodo even said two days ago, parties can change a lot uh, affiliations in one second. So there's still this hope that this is only a bargaining chip and, and some, <coughs> some of the, one or two of these Islamic parties, smaller Islamic parties, will, will cross across to Widodo and he'll have a majority and everything will be fine. So I suppose the best case scenario is that when that doesn't, if that doesn't happen, the and PDIP will fight, but maybe they won't. Yeah. Hi, my name is Nan Choi. Um, thanks uh, for sharing your insights and your observations. Uh, I do not really have any coherent analysis of the political development, <laughs> just like many people uh, sitting here. Um, and it's actually, I have found it quite actually surprising that you know, the uh, mood uh, from relief about the you know, Tokovi's election to this uh, kind of uh, you know, surprise finding of uh, you know, the, uh, the ability of Prabhu and his cronies uh, uh, of manipulating the democratic system, the democratic institutions uh, in uh, their own uh, interest. Uh, I have uh, two questions. One is actually um, the excitement about Jokowi's election was actually because of his uh, background as a local elite, and uh, you know, people actually attribute uh, his election to you know, the development around the decentralization, so that actually local elites could move uh, from local to national you know, political stages, and uh, there were you know, efforts to look other uh, you know, possible examples of who could actually. Be the next to Jokowi, uh, like you know, some you know, like Bandung's mayor and you know, the you know, Central Java governor and so on. So, do you see that you know, uh, whether we can uh, still have hope you know, from the emergence of uh, new kinds of local elites uh, who can actually be you know, the additional force uh, surrounding Jokowi? Uh, and another question is that uh, I'm also quite uh, puzzled about this connectedness of the party representatives. Uh, DPR and party uh, representatives or you know, uh, DPR members uh, in Jakarta and the uh, so like you know, as you mentioned the, the electorate was uh, almost evenly in a split. However, what actually can uh, propose can can do or have done or plan to do is kind of the you know kind of a uh, Proportionally, uh, not balanced. Uh, you know, not, it's not really exactly you know reflecting the um, aspirations of the, the electorate. In other words, uh, it was even almost evenly split. But now, what actually the party members uh, representing you know this uh, um, uh, problems can can do 
is not quite actually the, the reflection of the, the reality of the electorate. And I, I think this disconnecting is the, the system and uh, the support on the ground uh, is also somewhat puzzling. Well, the, the thing I have to remember is that the April elections, uh, there wasn't 50-50 or 53-47, it was actually 63-37. And I think that uh, that's uh, 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 a fundamental feature. I've sort of mentioned it and mentioned it briefly in, the, in passing, really, in the talk. Is that is the very, very low popularity of all the parties, which makes it possible for a party. And this is the anom anomaly which which the war forces clearly want to eliminate, it's possible for a party with minority support, PDIP, 19%, to put forward a candidate for president who wins 53%. And, and this is sort of, you know, this actually reflects the fact that the, the population at large has no confidence in any of the parties. They vote for parties reluctantly and half-heartedly. They look for a personality. They think the parties are all shit. Really, that's what they really think. And they know, you know, every party, which party has the most people in prison because of corruption? PGIP. They, all, they know all the parties are corrupt. They want some. There's no. They can't. Hope, they can't say we'll vote. We'll vote for the good party because they can't see any. That's why the absentee vote just you know, has kept rising. So there's a personality that arises uh, who. And one thing we can say about uh, Widodo, so far there's no evidence, any convincing evidence so far that he's, that he's been involved in any corruption. So far, yeah. no evidence has come to light. So, you know, people see him, he's willing to, he's willing, to, you know, has the appearance of willing to listen to the people, although his policies in Solo are not really any different than anywhere else. And, He's not corrupt. So you have a party that gets 19% in the parliamentary election, puts forward a candidate for president, and gets 53%. You put in place a, a problem. So it's not, I think it's not so difficult to, to explain. And the first part of the question was? Do you see the hope uh, from the emergency? Uh, no. I mean, the, the, <laughs> <laughs> the problem is, you see, everybody quotes uh, we don't do. The governor of Bandung, which is a pretty horrible guy, actually, if you ask the unions, he's, he's acted very harshly against the, the, the you know, labor sector. The, the, the mayor of Surabaya, governor of Surabaya, and the governor of Central Java, that's four. Right? But in many provinces, one third to two thirds of the Bupati are in corruption scandals. So to think that the decentralized elite, local elites, uh, on the whole, or you know, as a majority or as a significant trend, hopeful, most of the local elites are either in prison, about to be in prison, on the list to be in prison. I mean, that's the overwhelming majority. So. And now the big, the big test in, in respect to someone like uh, the, these, the better, the better figures like Wadodo or that have emerged is are they going, are they willing to fight for uh, Or are they just going to try and lobby and maneuver out of the out of the situation? Or are they, you know, because I think the problem is that someone like Wadodo and BDIP, if they have majority support in society as reflected in the 53% vote, and polls after the election, because of Prabowo's behavior that you referred to, actually pushed the polling up for Widodo up to 60%. Uh, he has to show that's reality. Because now you have your traditional executive versus parliamentary contradiction with the parliament saying, well, look, we, we were elected. Which, why is the presidential electors more legitimate than NAPO electors? Both elections. No one said back in April, oh, these elections are rigged. Have everyone accepted the April results? Which is more legitimate? 
course, one comes after the other, so you can say public opinion has changed between April and July, or you know something like that has happened, something like that has happened. But then that's just an argument. You have to show it, and the only way that's show show it. I mean, unfortunately, in the Indonesian legislature at the moment, there's no in, in, in the Indonesian legislation there's no mechanism for early elections. Well, it's not so unusual. This sounds like the U.S. Congress. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a bit like the U.S. Congress, but it's a split government. It's a split government that I think, in the end, in the Indonesian system, the, in the end, the parliament is more powerful than the president. So, you know, I think that's even the veto. The president does not have veto power. He can veto something, but after 30 days, it becomes a law anyway. mentioned was 140 plus pieces of legislation that were, can you give us some idea of what, what they're trying to push through? No. They just keep saying over and over again, that we have 122 pieces of legislation, the ones they, they, won't, they, they, they haven't published the list, but the ones they mention are always banking and telecommunications. Um, they they mention, say anything specifically about what in relation to banking and telecommunications? Uh, nothing, no, I haven't seen anything specific yet. And also, they, they say they're going to change all of the legislation which give good deals to the foreigners. <coughs> so what, what, what that actually means, does that mean, you know, changing legislation and deals so that they, because most of these guys are in business deals with foreigners. Hashim, Hashim's Prabhu's brother is, Prabhu is, Bakri is. They all themselves are in joint ventures with foreigners. So they're going to change the legislation to increase their portion, their share, is that or what? No, they, they, they won't be specific on anything, but they will have to be specific if they do indeed start to introduce legislation, but there's no... Because that, that could be a good hypocrisy test for what was run in the presidential campaign by Rebola, of course, if they start to do precisely that, which would make the parliamentary side of things quite interesting. And the one economic policy that they have up their sleeve, populist-wise, is that one of the things that Jokowi has always already, Widodo has already committed himself, is to increase fuel prices. Reducing the subsidy. Yeah, reducing the subsidy, which will result in increase in fuel prices. And Prabowo already said, now we, we're going to oppose that. And that's, that's uh, most of the population, most of the poor, no, most of the population, the poor, uh, don't want to see an increase in fuel prices, because they know it always, inevitably, every time it happens, there's a round of inflation. And the government can say, well, we'll give you, uh, you know, compensation, but they know. There's no point in reducing the subsidy on the one hand, because, and, and then uh, giving the money back to people that, with that, there's no point. I mean, the reason for, it, for reducing the subsidies is to give the money, to give the government money to do other things, which won't go directly, you know, which, which will benefit the other segments of society. So, that could, you know, that may be a popular move by a promoter if he, to make him unpopular with foreign business and the banks, the foreign banks, because they want reduction in subsidies. But in the short term, it will, be, it will probably be a popular decision. We have time for one more question in the back. No, sorry. No other questions. Sorry. If there are no other questions, then I'd like to again thank you, Max, for a very informative talk.